Stem cells can save lives. For blood cancer and blood disorder patients, a stem cell transplant may be their best chance of survival, but finding a donor is no mean feat. Anthony Nolan is a UK stem cell transplant charity that matches potential donors to patients in need of transplants. Since its inception in 1974, the charity has facilitated over 26,500 transplants for people around the world, supported patients through their transplant journeys, and carried out cell and gene therapy research to increase transplant success. We visited their sample processing labs and spoke to some of the team to learn more about the vital work that they do. We also talked to Raj, who underwent a stem cell transplant in 2020, about what the procedure was like and the impact it's had on his life. Pretty, pretty certain to say my life, would, my quality of life would not be like, like this without the without the transplant. Plus, we got the chance to explore the laboratory and find out how potential donor samples are processed in the hope of matching them to a patient. Anthony Nolan is a stem cell charity that saves the lives of people through matching patients to incredible individuals willing to donate their stem cells. We were set up in 1974 by an amazing woman called Shirley Nolan. She was searching for a matching donor for her son Anthony, who was diagnosed with a rare blood disorder. At the time, there was no stem cell register. There was no way of finding a potential match for her son. And so she decided that she would do something incredible and try and set up the world's first stem cell register. A stem cell transplant is a treatment for people with blood cancers and blood disorders. And um, often for those patients, their blood and their cells are not working as they should. Those patients need a stem cell transplant to survive, but often um, those people won't find a match in their family, um, which is why they turn to us at Anthony Nolan, um, and they turn to a stranger to donate their stem cells to give them a chance of life. We currently have over 900,000 people on our register who are willing to donate their stem cells, and we match um, those patients to the amazing person who could potentially save their life. Signing up to the register requires a cheek swab, which is used to determine which donors could be the perfect genetic match for a patient, but where does the sample go? To get a deeper insight into the process, we spoke to some of the laboratory scientists who work behind the scenes at Anthony Nolan. So in this space here, this is where we receive samples from first-time donors as well as potential um, patients and donors. And once they've been received in this space onto our lab management system, we then transfer them into the next room so we can extract the DNA from the samples, as well as test for any viruses the samples may have, as well as the blood grouping for the patients and donors. So once um, the samples come into this lab space here, we assign them sample IDs so that they can be loaded onto our MaxPrep, which is our liquid handling system. And um, from there, they will, the machine will transfer the samples into specific DNA extraction cartridges. And these cartridges use magnetic particles to basically extract the DNA from multiple different types of tissues, such as blood, buccal swabs, and cells. And we use the Promega Maxwell machines to do the extractions. And once that is complete, we then quantify the DNA using either the Glomax and the Qantas, which uses fluorescence to measure the amount of DNA in all of the samples. So after the samples have been received in the lab, they also come into this area where they get screened for viruses. We screen for hepatitis C, hepatitis B, HIV and CMV. All samples are screened for CMV, however, only donor samples are screened for the other three viruses. We also have our blood grouping machine. So every single sample that comes through this lab that is blood gets tested for their blood group um, it's preferable in a transplant for blood grouping to match both patient and donor, but there is possibility to have a stem cell transplant where there is a mismatch of blood grouping. So once the samples have been quantified and normalised, they're handed over to our team, ready for the process called next generation sequencing. Um, so first, before we get into the main part of next generation sequencing, we will have to amplify all the DNA that has been handed over to us. So this is occurs in a reaction called PCR, or polymerase chain reaction. Um, and here we will work to add primers and enzymes into all of the samples. Uh, so all of the DNA can be copied millions to billions of times in a machine called a thermocycler. 
we will focus specifically on the area of the HLA genes. So we will focus on 11 different areas of that HLA which have been scientifically proven to be important in stem cell transplant matching. Um, and matching those areas of HLA will allow a successful stem cell transplant between a patient and a donor. So we will prepare a reaction mix for each sample and for each 11 different areas of interest. Uh, these are added into plates, like so, and then added to a thermocycler. After the amplification has happened on the thermocycler, our samples are run along a gel electrophoresis uh, to a quality check that everything has worked in our amplifier. So our final stage of next generation sequencing is our library preparation stage. This is where we will have multiple steps, including our fragmentation step where we will cut all of our DNA into small pieces that we've just spent amplifying. Um, we will then add sticky ends to the end edges of all of these um, and then we will do a series of cleanup stages which uses magnetic beads to bind to all of the DNA present in the sample and then we will use a series of ethanol wash steps to clean away any contaminants. We will then do a final stage which is adding barcodes to the ends of each of our samples. So once all of our samples have those individual barcodes assigned which allows the sequencing machine to determine between them and we will be able to load them onto our sequencer. This allows our sequencer to then determine the HLA type for each of our patients and our donors to determine whether or not they are a match for stem cell transplant. So the clinical support team are the link between the transplant centre uh, and the laboratories. Uh, we have to liaise with internal teams, so that would be teams within the laboratory, uh, teams within the organisation, so search team. Uh, we liaise with our colleagues in the Nottingham Core Blood Bank. And all this is to provide clinical insight to allow the patient to get a transplant. So we send off the reports. We may have a discussion um, with the transplant centre as to which is the best donor for their, for their patient. Um, they may uh, want us to provide some insight into the level of matching, into whether the donor is going to be available quicker and that type of thing. Often a stem cell transplant is the last chance of survival for someone. It is their only chance of a cure. I'm Raj Palmer. I'm from Leicester. I was diagnosed with a blood cancer in 2015, October 2015, when I was 22 and I had my transplant in September 2020, I was 27. It was really uh, like quite surprising at the time of diagnosis. I, was, I just um, went for a routine um, eye test actually and they noticed some blood in my sort of um, eye scan and they said go to the GP, we weren't really sure what they were, what that was and then had multiple um, GP appointments where they did a number of blood tests and next thing I knew I had a bone marrow biopsy and that's how I got uh, the blood cancer diagno uh, diagnosis, yeah. So they did tell me from the outset that the bone marrow transplant would have been the only curative treatment. Um, there was other medication they could give you to reduce the symptoms. But yeah, I, I knew from the outset that that was the only curative treatment. Um, but having said that, they also said that they weren't sure when I would actually require the transplant because at the time I was sort of a lower risk or like, um, yeah, it I wasn't a case where I need the transplant within the next sort of three months. They said it could be up to sort of 10 years, really. So I did a lot of research and understood that it was obviously quite a, an intense process with, and what it would require. And I, I mean, at the time, I didn't know if I would have any um, donors as well. So I think they, they tested my brother. I have one sibling. They tested my brother. He wasn't a match. If we didn't have the stem cell register, um, then people would only be able to have a transplant if they had a match in their family. And we know that for most people, there isn't a match in their family. Um, so through the stem cell register, we are providing an opportunity for thousands of people to survive. They did make me aware that it could be a lot more difficult given my ethnic background, but yeah, finding a, a 10 out of 10 stem cell match on the registry could be more difficult would really ask anyone from a minority ethnic background to join the register. Again, we want everybody, um, regardless of their ethnicity, to find the best possible match. Um, so we need um, more diversity on the register. My doctors made me aware of Antonio and pretty soon after my diagnosis of especially all the helpful the leaflets and the information around treatment and the blood cancer they had available. Signing up to the register is easy. Anyone who is aged 
16 to 30 in good health is eligible to apply to the register, they can just go to anthonynolan.org forward slash join and fill in a short form. We will send them um, a pack in the post and they just need to do some cheek swabs and return that to us. When my doctor in the hospital went through um, the Anthony Nolan register to find my, my donor eventually, yeah. So yeah, involved um, sort of an intensive sort of chemotherapy dose. It's sort of um, about 10 days prior to the transfer. So I was admitted sort of 10 days pre-actual transplant, um, I received the stem cells. So that weakens your immune system, just a lot, a lot more prone to infections and um, also had to receive a lot of blood transfusions just to sort of get through that process. And then, yeah, after, then after you, you, ha you have your stem cells infused and that's, and then it's just a, a case of sort of hoping that those stem cells work and you sort of gradually recover. And so I was in hospital for six weeks during that period and then it was sort of very like two or three transfusions a week for the next sort of two months. And then it gradually, the transfusions gradually um, got, you know, reduced like in time frequency. And I mean, yeah, I had transfusions up to about 10 months a year uh, after the transplant. So yeah, quite a, lot of, quite a lot of blood and platelets infused as well as the stem cells. And yeah, it, the, the overall recovery was, it was hard. It was um, like just, I just sort of gradually just tried to, try to work up my appetite again and just do more and more exercise. So I just involved walking like started off just with like one kilometre a week and then um, yeah gradually increased that. So yeah, I was off work for a year post the transplant mm -hmm. and yeah it's probably only around a year and a half, two year mark where I was sort of really sort of I'd say almost back to my fitness levels before. We need as many people aged 16 to 30 to join the register. The more people on the register the better chance that we have of finding everybody who needs a match, their best possible match. We particularly need young men to join the register. We know that young people provide the best outcomes for patients, so we'd really encourage anyone um, 16 and above to join the register. We also find that men um, are more likely to donate. They currently make up just 18% of the register, but account for over half of donations, so we really need more men on the register. I guess I'm kind of proof that it does work, and. I think there's so much research and information about the the donation side, but yeah, it's you know it's not it's not that invasive, and um, like obviously the amount of help you can do to someone like like me, it's or you know thousands of other people around the world, it's it's clear to see. So for the donor, it's relatively straightforward. They might feel a little bit tired, a little bit achy the next day. Essentially, they've given someone a chance of life. I just like to yeah, obviously thank them for for signing up to the registry and, and yeah, helping me. Because yeah, it's been, I'll be four years post-transplant in September and yeah, just in those last four years I've, I've done so many amazing things. I've, I've worked in New Zealand, I've been traveling. Yeah, I've, I've just, yeah, just been able to do so much more. I've been active again and probably the fittest I've ever been, to be honest, like I do a lot more exercise. I play badminton and just really thank for them. And, yeah. We have given 22,000 people a chance of life through a stem cell transplant so far and we need to continue to grow the register so we can give more people the best chance of finding their best possible match. Yeah. Pretty, pretty certain to say my, life would, my quality of life would not be like this without the, without the transplant. <laughs>